I am going to talk about after the variation comes something new, grammaticalization in French support verb constructions. Now, initially, I wanted to talk about grammaticalization in French support verb constructions with regard to the tighter fusion between the support verb and the predicative noun and wanted to take a morphological perspective. Now, since the conference got delayed by a year and the paper, fortunately or unfortunately, got published in the meantime, I went back to the drawing board and what we are going to do today is to take a more syntactic perspective. So that explains why there is maybe a bit of divergence between the abstract and the paper. So what are we going to do? I'm going to tell you about what support verb constructions are and how they behave. Then we're going to look at what happens to them, what processes they are involved in. And primarily we want to think about what material can intervene between the support verb and its predicative noun. I'm going to call that the support verb construction field or the SVC field. We're going to think about how support verb constructions vary and how this variation then results in change. And finally, we are going to think about what's new with support verb constructions, basically a brief summary and conclusion. So let's get started with the definition. On the slide, you have two nice examples of the support verb construction avoir ou vi. The difference between the two examples and the reason they are both on the slide is that in the first one, there's nothing intervening between avoir and envie. In the second one, the phrase tout simplement is intervening between the support verb a and the predicative noun envie. And that is what we are primarily interested in today. Now, what are support verb constructions? Very generally speaking, um, you have avoir ou vi in the examples at the bottom in the box. You see, I have a couple more to take a step. Faire attention, uh, Stellung nehmen. Generally speaking, they are constructions that consist of a support verb and a predicative noun. So they are verb, noun, and predicate direct object, multi word, uh, multi -word expressions. The verb and the noun enter into a division of labor, semantically speaking, and the criterion that I applied in order to decide then, or in order to limit my data collection to a very, or as homogeneous a data set as possible, is that I wanted to have co-referentiality between the predictive noun and the subject of the sentence. So for example, in nous avions envie, the nous is the person who is also doing the the wanting the envie part. So why not um, something like run a race, attirer l'attention and ein Haus bauen, um, just to approach this negatively this, um, definition. So run a race is an internal object, um, attirer l'attention doesn't pass my co-referentiality criterion, ein Haus bauen, that is your prototypical um, verb object construction where you don't have a semantic division of labor and um, where you have basically a full verb and the house the the, the house is um, your object kind of a neutral in nest terms or something that comes into being over the course of this action. There are different approaches to constructions similar to support verb constructions and so there's obviously the support verb constructions approach which um, basically contrast support verbs with operator verbs that are these are verbs that have a, um, exclusively syntactic function full verbs and idiomatic expressions these are things like lend a hand where you can't deduct the meaning of the whole constructions from um, by summing up its parts then there are there's the approach of light verbs um, which are my primarily um, contrasted with auxiliary verbs and I put but and Lahiri's um, criteria on the slide so there should be a corresponding main verb that they, sh they should span the entire verbal paradigm they do not display a defective paradigm and they are restricted in their combinations now most of those also apply to our support verbs and um, the corresponding main verb is a bit difficult because you never know like in what sense so do you kind of want one it an entomological one or it's semantics enough think of something like avoir peur and craindre um, the entire verbal paradigm doesn't always work with our support verbs and um, think of something like I take a decision versus I'm taking a decision. The first one doesn't really work in English. Um, so apparently there's something a spectral going on. Um, 
So the paradigm uh, can sometimes be a bit defective. Restricted in their combinations, definitely they are. As you will see, you cannot just replace the support verb in any way. So in a sense, they are similar, but also different. The third approach, the third big approach is function verbs. Um, the function verb line of, line of research, this is a bit wider. So basically there you include as a function verb, equivalent to our support verb, also the verb to be. You include and even consider primary prepositional phrases in the predicative noun slot, something like mettre en relief or so. And you accept uh, concrete nouns in the predicative noun slot without any problems. Um, they will have to be, if you look on the right hand side at this on the on the slide in the right lower corner, you see I have an example, prendre une photo, where you see um, you can use um, concrete nouns, but they do have to be a bit reconceptualized. So photo is the object, prendre une photo is the process resulting in the object. Right, so what issues do we then come up with for support verb constructions? Well, the main issue is um, if we, we have them at the syntax semantics interface. Um, so morphologically or morphosyntactically, we kind of have, we have two units, we have a verb and a noun, um, but in terms of kind of semantic unit, um, we have only one. Um, so that then creates map problems um, in terms of mapping um, there are different approaches to data collection and to support verb constructions in general, but they apply primarily to the data collection. So there's a semantic approach where you define a group of nouns and verbs um, to be considered. Um, very often, as I say, we operate, we marginalize concrete nouns and we work with abstract nouns and then um, general verbs like avoir faire, etc. Um, that does show that um, different nouns and different verb classes raise different questions and that's a very heterogeneous group of constructions but obviously you kind of predefine the verbs and nouns. Um, support verb constructions are verb noun collocations so they are a semi-productive group of constructions if you think of something like take a step which I had on the previous slide you can't say make a step in English that doesn't work. Um, the fusion of the noun and the verb um, is quite tight. How tight exactly? That is what we are going to think about today. Um, yeah, so, so much about the definition. Let's think about the question at hand. So we want to think about the distance between the noun, the support verb and the predicative noun. Um, so I thought about, well, what constructions are similar? What other constructions have this kind of field between their two pieces? Um, the two constructions that came to mind are phrasal verbs in English and tometic or the Phenomenotomesis in Greek. Let's start with the phrasal verbs, maybe more um, something people are more familiar with. So um, phrasal verbs are things like to pick up, as in John picked up the book versus John picked the book up. Now, in order to decide whether this direct object, the book, goes into the into the field between the verb and the particle, the p word, um, you dis uh, you look at how topical is the direct object, how long is it, and how idiomatic is the transitive phrasal verb. Um, uh, Greece and Stefanovic have also found that the type of the particle actually um, plays a role. So there's a lexical element involved. In Greek, tmesis means that you have compound verbs. This means there's a main um, a full verb, a main verb, um, here ephage, um, to um, eight, and there is a prefix, which is sort of adverbial. Um, so you could um, have kata or cut ephage, that would be what you would expect. Um, now, tmesis means you cut them apart, a bit like separable compound verbs in German. So, um, I don't know, something like rausgehen, ich gehe raus, where you have to cut them apart in the present tense. In Greek, you do the same thing. And in this field in between, you can put things. Now, there's a hierarchy what you can put in there. So, um, what goes in there is, again, objects, um, less commonly subjects, and even less commonly other things. In terms of information structure, you primarily put in there ratified topics, meaning topics that are salient in the context, um, less commonly narrow focus elements, even less commonly non-ratified topics, and then even less co commonly other stuff. Um, Bertrand compares that quite nicely um, with noun incorporation across languages, so that you have the noun that is kind of in this field um, getting incorporated into the structure. So bottom line of those two, what you see is there are quite some constraints on what can go in such a field um, between two elements of a multi-word expression. Now in our French support verb constructions, what can theoretically intervene? Um, basically modifications of the predicative noun, such as determiner phrases or adjectives for sure. If you think about décision, prendre, I don't know, une bonne décision, um, well, you already have two things in there. 
Um, two partite negatives, because when you want to negate, you negate the support verb, obviously. The verb and the noun are not fused tightly enough or univerbated or anything that you would put the negative afterwards. Um, and also adverbs and adverbial phrases. Now, these are the ones we are interested in, because these are the ones that you could put somewhere else. And the question is, where could you put them? Well, a, or, or these are the options I've seen in my corpus, you could put them with a superordinate verb. So you make the support verb construction an inf infinitive and you put before that infinitive a modal verb, an impersonal construction, something like this, and then you can supplement this with the adverbial phrase. You can put the adverbial phrase in extra position, so dislocation into the right or left periphery. You can put them, which I found interesting, in parentheses, so usually in commas. Um, and then they can, in theory, go in between the verb and the noun. This is especially relevant to dates. Um, or you can obviously, you can modify the predicate noun, the subject, the object, etc. So go from an adverb to probably um, an adjective or an attributive phrase, um, or in some way, um, adverbial phrase with the subject or so. Um, but in this way, you could get them out of this SVC field. So there are options. Right, so... So far, so good. Now, support verb constructions, as we said, they are not kind of completely static, as in they don't just stay or there's not just one support verb construction for every noun. So what happens is a nouns, predicative nouns combined with a range of verbs. Um, often there is a difference in either aspect, for example, avoir versus perdre, um, or in voice, donner versus recevoir. Um, or you also have some sociolectal variation that does not always result in morphosyntactic, more morphosyntactic changes, but it might. Um, we have a morphological means of modification, which we've already mentioned, so we can in Depending on the support verb construction, we can um, add a determiner phrase or an attributive phrase to the predicative noun. And obviously there are arguments and adjuncts. Um, now arguments I didn't find in the SVC field or only one I will show you and that's an outlier. Adjuncts I did find, so these are the ones we are interested in. Um, I've given you one example of um, an, um, a support verb construction and how much it can actually change um, even if you don't do anything to the verb so nothing lexical nothing morphological but you only change it syntactically um, avoir raison and that's what we have at the bottom of the slide now in order to check the degree of fusion of the support verb and the nominal element I looked through Langer's syntactic tests, um, so he tests referentiality of the predicate noun phrase, semantically reduced state of the support verb and the status of the complements. And I worked out the ones that are relevant to this question. So in terms of variability of the predicate noun, um, what is relevant to us, or referentiality, sorry, um, referen referentiality of the predicative noun, what's relevant to us is whether you can modify or vary this predicative noun. So whether you can put a determiner phrase or an adjective with it, because obviously that could go into this field. Here you have une décision difficile, difficile goes after, well, lucky us, but if you had une bonne décision, you would already have another element in this field. Um, in terms of semantic reduction, the one that's interesting um, for us is the adverb versus attribute. Um, in the example, you see we interchange fréquemment, the adverb, with fréquent, where we basically modify the predicate noun in order to get it out of this field in the middle. Um, and in the terms of states of the complements, what's interesting to us is the extra position, because that is where we can relegate adverbial phrases to um, in order to get them out of our SVC field. Now, what proce processes are relevant? Um, obviously, grammaticalization. So that means an item moves from having a clear, pragmatic, and or lexical function to being a more functional element in the morphosyntactic structure. And the process is driven by reanalysis and analogy. Now, famously, our observable results are phonetic reduction. Think of something like going to versus gonna in English. Um, morphological and syntactic reanalysis, which we are going to talk about today. And or semantic bleaching. Think of the English will. Um, future where you have um, nowadays the will basically having a tiny bit of a volitional semantics but primarily it's just indicating a future um, after you know being a, um, a modal verb for a while. Um, the other process that I think is relevant is lexicalization. So the process of listing or the state of listedness, that is the property of some element to be a lexical item of a language. Um, because as we said, so the board verb constructions are verb noun collocations, and these be might become more lexicalized. Um, so they might fuse a bit tighter. 
Now, since we are talking about fusion and about um, the intervening items, I thought about, well, okay, so in theory, do we think maybe the support verb and the predicate are predicate noun could univerbate. So is that kind of a thought that kind of, if, would that work? So I mean, compounding is the output of morphology, multi-word expressions are the output of syntax. And I put the criteria for multi-word expressions on the slide and support verb constructions tick all the boxes. So you have several syntactic units, it's one semantic unit, um, the combinations are more frequent than the expected frequency of joint occurrence of their parts, and they have a syntactic irregular or deficient structure. Well, so they do tick all the, bo the boxes. All also, verbal compounding in Romance languages does not or is not very common. So let's say we don't necessarily expect univerbation. Um, there seems to be a clear line to be drawn. So I then thought, OK, right, I've got the theory down. Let's look at some data. Let's actually see what happens. I looked at a sample of about one million words of um, Le Monde, 1998, um, which is journalistic French. Um, and I work with concordance software to make my life a bit easier. I chose a range of predicative nouns, um, a nice combination of nouns or predicative nouns that are basically undebated in the research literature, um, have been around for a while, um, abstract nouns, which are typically considered predicative nouns and then um, two concrete nouns in order to show that they actually can form support verb constructions. I ended up with 333 relevant um, instances and for all of these I extracted the number and kind of intervening items. Um, I extracted other adverbial expressions belonging to the same verbal kernel because I wanted to know, well, are there other adverbial expressions and where are they? So where did, where do we where else can we put them? Do they have to go into that field? Does the sentence look like this? Or could we put them somewhere else? Um, and I identified then outliers and non-relevance and calculated statistics. So non-relevance are passives. I um, took out all the passives because that's a completely different sentence structure. I also considered outliers all non-declarative sentences, questions and split support verb constructions, meaning where you have the predicate noun in the superordinate clause and the support verb in a dependent relative clause. Um, other outliers are where one syntactic unit is represented by a multi-word morphological expression. Um, the large ones are relative clauses and parentheses between commas. However, there are also, for example, adverbial phrases in the form of prepositional phrases that are a bit longer. Um, Outliers are also created by quotations because you can't cut apart quotations in journalism, but um, you put them in quite frequently. So what I get to is the average of intervening items, ignoring all the passives, um, is about 1.21, um, but 30, 93 instances actually have no intervening material. So what does intervene? Primarily adverbs, prepositional phrases, discourse markers and negatives. Um, as we said, negatives can't really be moved, so I put them in grey, we're not too interested in them. There's one odd one out um, where we um, have the, um, the indirect object um, between the verb and the noun, however, and that is the only outlier I forgot to mention, that is the sequence of predicative nouns. So in theory, both these nouns could form a support verb construction with the verb, but they shouldn't apply, appear in a sequence because that creates like this kind of no longer parallel structure. So this is actually an outlier, we don't have to worry about this. Now, here's my data set. Um, the category NA is passive. Category 0 to 9 means 0, 0 intervening item, 1, 1 intervening item. You get the idea. So what you see is that instances cluster in categories 0 to 4. Um, and we have quite an unequal spread of the data for different um, predicate nouns. So what I thought is I'll see, um, I'll try to find out whether there's anything that kind of causes this un or whether this unequal spread is actually statistically significant. So I lumped together categories zero and one because as I said, we can't move negatives. So if you have a split negative, that thing is not going to move. So I thought it's kind of the right thing to do to lump those two together. Then categories two to four means you have at least a prepositional phrase or so in the middle. And categories five to nine means you have longer units in the middle. Now the question is, are they I said, is this kind of unequal distribution statistically relevant, uh, significant or not? Um, so my H0 and null hypothesis was 
they are kind of actually equally distributed. My um, alternative hypothesis, hypothesis is they are not equally distributed. I very basically applied a chi-square test to this, um, the general thing. So the alpha level is 0 0.05. I have two degrees of freedom because I've got three categories, remember. Um, and I let Python do and crunch the chi-square statistics for me. Um, I put everything as a, in a collab document, so feel free to check that out obviously later. Um, the results are actually statistically significant, so I could dismiss the null hypothesis, but the samples for Kerr and for Tor, my two um, concrete nouns, are just too small to do any kind of meaningful chi-square statistics. So these two put in brackets, basically. Tendencies are that adverbs of manner and frequency can be in this SVC field, whereas longer adverbious phrases can usually not, except if they are framed in as parentheses in commas. However, there are exceptions to the rule, as always. Um, so adverbs of manner and frequency appear occasionally outside the SVC field. They are kind of basically pushed out of it. And adverbial phrases, possibly lexicalized ones, appear inside the SVC field. Um, things like sans doute, where you kind of feel like, well, this is quite lexicalized as a phrase. Um, there are differences between SVCs, even those with the same um, predicate noun. And that kind of is a result in itself. So obviously, I just lumped these together by predicative noun. Um, but um, I will show you well, you've already seen, and I will show you in more detail that actually every support verb construction with a predicative noun is different um, morphosyntactically and semantically. Um, that's, yeah. So one of Langer's tests for support verb constructions was, can you omit the support verb? Well, in theory, you have the example on the slide that is syntactically correct, but um, I'm not sure this test actually completely works um, because you do lose something semantically. So the predicate noun usually gives you the actions art and the support verb determines the aspect, voice, etc. Now, if you lose things like aspect and voice, that might actually impact on your morphosyntactic or your, on your syntactic environment, um, not just on your semantic environment. Also, the predicate noun in combination with different support verbs or predic um, prepositions, if you allow for those, assume slightly different meanings. Um, I try to show you that with um, by um, assigning thematic roles to the predicate noun. I just used ness, um, neat and tidy roles because I could do my box ticketing exercise as you've seen here. Um, so very common in support verb constructions are obviously change of state um, constructions. So we have a neutral as the PN, as the predicate noun, prendre décision, prendre photo. Um, you could also have the predicate noun um, taking the role of an instrument or so something you use, and by you something that instigates, but you have to use it in order to instigate something. So um, think about something donner raison um, versus avoir raison, then faire avoir un coeur. Um, the predicate noun becomes the pa patient when you have a semantic passive, something like recevoir adieu. And I took it as a force when you're talking about emotions, avoir envie, avoir peur. But now, this changes, obviously. So as soon as you go from, say, if we just stick with our forces here, from avoir envie to donner envie, you rather have probably an instrument because you are... So the envie is still instigating something, but you are now, you kind of give it to, or you kind of, um, yeah, you move it, so, so you affect it, meaning it's no longer a force. Um, you can play the same game with other... Um, options as well. I've put a couple of semantic passives at the bottom of the slide. So you see by changing the support verb, I change the semantic makeup. And as a result, I might also change the syntactic requirements of my support verb construction. So maybe lumping all the predicate nouns together was not a great idea of mine. Um, but that is a result in itself. So what happens synchronically and diachronically? Synchronically, we've seen this within um, verbal paradigm variation. I've just put a syntactic example um, and um, one of my distance measure examples on the slide. There's between verbal paradigms, um, a variation, again, a syntactic example and my distance measures um, show that they differ in terms of their semantic, uh, syntactic behavior, sorry, and they differ in terms of their semantic makeup. So it's quite a heterogeneous group of constructions. Now, diachronically, the smaller the collocational range, range gets, the stronger the collocation gets. Um, a good example is there with per, where you have actually quite a small range of options versus something like attention. Um, the longer an item combination is around, the more grammaticalization, etc., it can undergo. Again, if you compare something like 
peur versus attention as a predicative noun, you see quite a nice um, distinction. Um, the more an item is used and the more context um, it is meant to apply to, the larger the likelihood that new support verb constructions are added to the picture. Um, my favorite there is again attention actually, because in the corpus you have the normal ones, things like faire attention, attirer attention, but you also have a couple of very innovative ones that probably are at the moment not yet um, kind of completely lexicalized, but that might become if you need them more often. Um, and items move, may move obviously into different registers, either up or down, um, or even become stigmatized like any other lexical item. So to sum up, um, support verb constructions form an internally heterogeneous group of semi-productive constructions. Similar to phrasal verbs or thematic constructions, um, support verb constructions only allow for a very limited number of specific items to intervene between the verb and the noun. And the predicative noun in support verb constructions can take on the roles or different roles, um, and that will change the both the semantic makeup and also the syntactic requirements. Now, in terms of grammaticalization, we looked mostly at the morphological and syntactic reanalysis of this noun verb constructions, and I put two nice examples. Avoir très peur is, I think, what you also find in a dictionary. Faire très attention, I find quite, found quite interesting because there you have attention and quite a lexicalized construction or grammaticalized construction, where you have those two tightly enough fused that you put an adverb in the middle rather than something like beaucoup de or so. Um, and then conversely, um, I have another one um, at the bottom. So where you have a beaucoup retenu l'attention, um, there you actually still need to work with beaucoup. And that is it. Thank you for your attention.